Thank you. The impact of climate change on livestock in the tropics. Let me first of all set the context for what I'm about to say. It is important to realise from the beginning that the issues that we are talking about differ between more developed countries and less developed countries. And the tropics refers, of course, to less developed countries much more than more developed countries. Yet many of us who are participating in this conference are from a wealthy cohort that may be in a less developed country, but that's much more part of the minority of the world. The majority of the world is the poor people. This means that a blanket policy thought up in our situation about what we know and what we experience may be well-meaning, may be well thought out for the things that we're experiencing, but it can prejudice the development of people in less developed countries in those situations and raise the ethical dilemma between climate mitigation and well-being of people. This is not to detract from the problems that occur from livestock production and climate change. That's both the impact on the livestock and the livestock impact on climate change. In the latter category, ruminants, cattle, sheep and goats and so on produce methane as part of their efficient digestive processes. This is important, important in many ways, but it's also creating a greenhouse gas that's very powerful. Let me emphasise the importance of livestock. Livestock, in economic terms, make up 40% of agricultural GDP. That's the world's agricultural GDP. But more important than that, about a billion people, poor people in marginal situations, rely on animal products for essential nutrients such as choline, vitamins A, B12, iron, zinc, which cannot be accessed by them from other sources. It's all very well to say that we can access them in the lifestyles we lead, but these people have no other access. So they rely on those things for mental and physical development, and without proper mental development, those people cannot benefit from education, for example. Returning to the global comparisons, milk and meat, those two products alone, make up five of the six most valuable food products of the world. Then to counter that, we know that 25 to 40 per cent of the nitrogen on farms comes from livestock that are on those farms, small farms in the poorer parts of the world. If that wasn't there, we would have to create that nitrogen in the form of fossil fuel produced ammonia and urea fertilisers. These people, about 750 million smallholder livestock producers, are diverse. And in the future, we have projected that there might be about one third that find an alternative livelihood, probably in cities, and therefore need more food. Another third might succeed in market-oriented livestock livelihoods and thereby move into the style of livestock production that we are more associated with and about one third remain in the smallholder production system. That system is the subject of much research that I will talk more about. All of this has to take place within the context of food and nutritional security. Nutritional security, of course, refers to those marginal nutrients which are not otherwise available to these people. So the policy that is used for this research work is to turn smallholders into smart holders. The International Livestock Research Institute, for example, has a mission statement such as thriving enterprises that would be part of a vibrant, productive and resilient food system with less climate and other environmental impacts. A noble objective. But at the same time as doing that, we have the impacts of climate on the livestock themselves in the tropics. So we expect to be having a hotter uh, environment so that the heat and nutritional stress that's introduced will impact on livestock yields, on livestock production. The increase of variability of climate and the extremes would lead to changes in pasture productivity, in disease vectors, the diseases that affect animals and the diseases that transfer from those animals to us. And this all points to a need for a change in production systems. This is already occurring. In research terms, this is based on adaptation. 
It's all very well for us to talk about mitigation, but when we talk about people, livelihoods, looking after their children, it's about adapting to the changes in climate. And this is about maintaining or improving productivity, sustaining the resource base, and minimising zoonotic risks. A zoonotic risk is a disease passing from animals to humans. And we know that this has occurred in the region and in recent times. In terms of adaptation domains, we can talk in general terms of nutrition. In terms of forages that animals eat or other foodstuffs that they eat, molecular genetic applications, which is being spoken about by another expert in this conference. In terms of animal genetics, we can talk of breeding, and this is complex genetic work, breeding animals that are suited to the emerging environments, while at the same time conserving genetics that we must need for the future. We can also talk of genetic manipulation related to methane production, but this is at very early stages. In terms of animal health, we can talk of the health interaction between livestock and humans, the health of the livestock, climate sensitive disease surveillance and control. Much of this is often put under the terminology of One Health and One Health can encompass the environmental, the human and all other aspects of health in one concept. A practical outcome of this work that is occurring at the International Livestock Research Institute is climate risk mats and this is in fact a policy support tool that can be used and can be talked about further in our discussion. In integrating our scientific and policy research, we have to address methane emissions, and these can in fact be reduced by increasing production efficiency of animals. It's all very well to talk of feeding animals a, a certain product of, uh, of seaweed, for example, but the real gains come from producing more animal product per animal so that there's less methane produced per animal product. The environment can also benefit from those so that you have less animals for those outputs. We'll also be talking about animal and human disease transfers that are reduced by research. And a meta-analysis covering all livestock research across a wide spectrum has shown research returns that exceed 10 to 1, encompassing all the research, including that that went nowhere. These are amazing investments. It tells me that there is much more potential in this sector. A lot of this work is coming from the International Livestock Research Institute, an organisation with which I continue to be associated, and the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, of which I'm a commissioner. These two institutions collate, motivate and fund organisations engaged in individuals engaged in international livestock research. From a policy point of view, both are engaged, linking the scientific information to policy information. The third organisation mentioned in this is the International Food Policy Research Institute. It deals with food policy. These are the critical organisations for international and regional collaboration. So to round off, if I had to project some changes that will occur for livestock in the tropics as a result of climate change, I would expect we would see increased productivity, especially in ruminants, which would reduce greenhouse gas emissions per unit of product. And this would result in improved health, nutrition and genetics, the research focusing on those areas. I'd expect smaller herd sizes. However, the factor working against this all the time is the demand from wealthy people like us. If we order a steak in a restaurant, we're part of the problem. Small farmers linked to efficient value chains I'd expect this to occur more in the future. Novel disease challenges, including zoonotic diseases. We have to be on the lookout. We have to be having strong surveillance services for this 
and means of countering this early on at the animal stage rather than when it gets to humans. There should be enhanced biosecurity for intensive production facilities, pigs and poultry. The swine fever outbreak at the moment must be weighing on many people's minds. And contextualising the ongoing research of all of these things within the climate and environmental changes is an essential part of the research. These are the many factors that I think are important in livestock and the impact of climate on those livestock in the tropics. I expect that collaboration will be enhanced by gaining greater involvement of the existing global and regional research bodies. That is the imperative, not to start a new organisation, but to bring together all of those people working on these issues. Thank you.